it, it's part of the process creatively get to back to what this is all about which is being fun right <laughs> the drums are great so i feel great when i go the way i'm touching that way i'm playing my quarter note it has history it's not just like jeffy has a stick and he's doing that so you learn to control the dynamic from that quarter note from jimmy cox quarter note philly joe's quarter note uh tony williams quarter note uh brian blade's quarter note Jeff is actually going to be talking about the quarter note, and a lot of you may gloss over that, but he's going he's gonna to show you just exactly what all you can do with it and what you cannot do without it. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, if, wow. if any of you tuned in for Dave King's session, uh, the jazz, great. This I, I have a feeling we'll kind of uh, start getting in some territory that we did in there as well. So um, Jeff, man, you want to play for a second? I don't sure, know. Man. I'll, you know what I'll do? Um, I, this is always a great introduction onto everybody's love of rhythm, you know, and then my aesthetic is you're just sitting on drums with that rhythm. So I would like to kind of get past, we all kind of know some very fundamental things, but no matter how far down the road you get as a musician or artist, you are still coming back to the foundational stuff, you know, and this is it. For me so i'll just demonstrate what you can do with a quarter note sound Got good you. all right <clears throat> i can do a crush and no stick it's, it's all the same Sorry, no matter what I'm playing, that's my my love, my home base, my guru, my educator, my teacher, follower, everything is right here. So no matter what you do. I'm thinking that. So that's kind of where I wanted to start and say, you know, how do you guys think of the quarter note? And do you limit yourself by thinking of this is this idiom. This is this idiom. I'm Cheryl Crow. I'm like Dave Matthews. I'm, you know, James Taylor in the 70s. I'm, I'm Steve Gatt. So that type of thinking seems to box drummers in versus just the freedom to do whatever the crap you want. Basically, <laughs> they're, they're here for you. And a lot of drummers sit down and they think drums backwards to themselves. And they get really, and I, do, I used to do it, which is why I can speak on it. And it was, it was, it was just isolating or it was just, um, it would freeze you. You get real tense versus I know it's coming from me because <laughs> the drums are inanimate. So they're just going to respond to that energy. So the quarter note, that's your energy ball. That's your life force. That's everything that comes from you, um, your heart, mind, and soul out your hands. And then you can just play what you feel. So a lot of drummers get so frustrated you know, especially dudes that aren't doing it for a living, but just do it for fun. And it kind of takes the fun out of it when you're overthinking it. You know, so when I play, I'm literally thinking of, I've already forgotten you cats are there you know, just so I can play. Because if I'm sitting here thinking everybody's watching me, I'll get nervous. But in order to beat that nervous stuff, you just go, yeah, let it go. You don't care. You're going to 
enjoy what you're hearing as you play it. All right, so what do I need to work on? I'll sit down. All right, quarter note. That way I'm not thinking. I'm like rising above myself, watching myself play a quarter note. That's the key to losing yourself there and then erasing all that mental doubt that we all drummers have you know that inner deep seated like ah, i'm never good enough but we are i mean the reason we are we are drawn towards this instrument because we are drummers we are been have we have been been having we've had that gift given to us so therefore when i sit with the quarter note on this instrument you can take away all this stuff but as long as i have something to hit somewhere i can groove <clears throat> no matter what you know what does it, especially even like ballads, that right there can be. And you wouldn't think I'm playing, I'm going, but I'm thinking that in my head so I can keep that even because the evenness of that brings me the enjoyment. That makes right. sense. Right. So, just so, and, even. <laughs> and just, and just like, you know, because it's interesting, I think so many players think of it in the opposite way. So it's kind of like they establish where the, 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 the tempo is, mm -hmm. and then they think about whatever pattern it is that they're trying to hash out. Right. And that becomes the focus instead of thinking of the, the quarter note first. So your, your internal pulse, where it all needs to actually be syncing up with, and then mm -hmm. secondary thinking, okay, now I need to take this thing and I, do, I need to put it with this quarter note instead of thinking, right putting all types of crap onto the beat. <clears throat> if you think about, you can't build, you can't just dump a building and it's a building. <laughs> you know, you right. have to have, you know, clear the land first. Clearing the land is when I say, don't think about yourself. Just think about what you're doing and enjoying that enjoyment of doing it. And, and that kind of takes a fork in the road and goes this way instead of the long, you know, overrated stop sign, stop light of our minds stopping us from creating. So the word creativity just flows off your mouth. It's creative. It's like from the creator. So the creativity that lives within us that a lot of drummers seem to have um, issues untapping or tapping into because of the comparative thing. So when I have my quarter note, I don't compare it to anybody's quarter note. Uh, everybody's got a different beat, a different pulse, a different, you know, journey in life. Some are here, some are here, some are here. So your quarter note is exactly who you are, wherever you are. So if I come home from a long day at the office and I'm a drummer and I just want to, you know, do this. I'll take it back to you two days, buddy. All right. So that having that freedom of mindset to just play and not think about, I got to work on this. I got to be that. I'm not as good as this guy. I'm not that fast or my hands are slow. It, it's part of the process creatively, but to get to back to what this is all about, which is being fun, right? You're supposed to, I mean, <laughs> drums are great. So I feel great when I go. And I know it's coming from like a Jimmy Cobb thing. I have a foundational base, like a historical lineage of that, the way I'm touching that, way I'm playing my quarter note, it has history. It's not just like Jeffy has a stick and he's doing that. So you learn to control the dynamic from that quarter note, from Jimmy Cobb's quarter note, Philly Joe's quarter note, uh, Tony Williams' quarter note, uh, Brian Blade's quarter note, Carter Buford, man, total different stratosphere. You know, Neil Peart, way over here. <clears throat> You know, his quarter note is, ah, it's like, it's almost metronomic. You know, it's just like right there, right on the very tip of the watermelon, whereas mine's kind of here, you know. And so I think life shifts with that quarter note that's firm, but not exactly like perfect, you know. Right, letting the, letting the humanity come through. And so, yes, you know, yeah. using, using that quarter note almost as, your your launching point you know if you're out in the ocean and you've got this pier that you're swimming from 
using that almost as your safety net that you can go back to any time. I think a lot of times, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but people, drummers will get nervous because to go back to that safety net, sometimes you have to allow some space in there and some, and some, some mm. silence to actually yeah. go back to that, to yeah. that quarter. Does that make sense to pull back from what you're doing to assess and then dive back in? Does that make sense? Yeah, man, it does. And, and the word space uh, is your friend and it's taken, and I'm still learning how to, you know, get along with space. Because I hear a lot of stuff, and I, you know, let's just play this little fast second line. I'm hearing a lot of stuff, and I'm supposed to play this. Forever. But I'm hearing all other types of stuff, and me, like you're saying, allowing that space to happen between each beat was a very esoteric can't touch it you can't feel it i mean you can feel it but you can't touch it but it's there but you can't see it that's what's so beautiful about music in time you know it, it's it's clearly you know every day as time as time passes it's the same way you feel your days it's the same way i feel my quarter note uh this afternoon or tonight would be different and i'm open to that i'm not trying to get to this like number one position in the boxing world where i'm the champion it's like the opposite of that. I'm just, I, I get second place is so much easier to come in in my head and not have to put so much pressure on myself. And then that kind of dissipates that anxiety, that worry, that fear that we all have for performing in front of other people uh, on a very uh, aggressively <laughs> loud, but yet soft instrument, man. I mean, you, you just want to hit it, but also you're like, well, I got, you know. Uh, so that, that just helps me to stay excited about it. You know, when I sit down, I smile because I was smiling from the inside out because man, dude, this is, this is my love. I love the drums. I look at the drums and still love the drums. And being Steven with you in your studio with Grant there, and you let me play your kit with your sound and your colors and that prototype and just like the flump flump over here. That's a different Jeff, you know? Jeff on this kit is more, it's just a little livelier, but, but on that kit, I would have to calm it down a lot because of the nature of the, the instrument. You know? you know, and that's, that's, so that's something that, that I've uh, told people multiple times is I almost enjoy different drum kits now mm -hmm. because when I sit down, let's say I sit down at a kit that's got a, you know, little, 15 16 inch kick and it's tuned up real high and and you've got some real warm mellow cymbals there's a it's true there's a different me that comes out on that i play differently than if i play on this kit and i play differently on this kit than if i was playing on you know whatever other configuration of kit there's a, and it took me a long time to be okay with that i for a long time i would be like oh i need to play like me on this you know high-pitched kit i need to play like you right. know the same sound it took me a while to go no no it's okay because you're a different person with your first son than you are with your second son than you are with your wife like you're okay with changing whenever you're with people i think it's an, an you know an important thing because a lot of our students and members have have anxiety when it comes to playing on new new kits or, or unfamiliar kits yeah and just unfamiliar experiences man like even right now i'm a tad nervous because um <clears throat> You know, I, I'm more, I, my personality, as I get older, I like to groove with people more than being like a solo drummer or taking solo. So, I mean, I love soloing here at the house, going crazy by myself, you know, because <laughs> nobody can hear it. It's just me, <laughs> just getting it out. But then on the thing that comes back to that, oh, it's my turn to do it. And, you know, there's such a wow factor in our society. Everything's a wow factor versus just real, true art, like true meaningful groove that you can just sit there like Ahmad Jamal. I mean, dude, for now, man, it's just all night. So I sit here, all right, I'm playing with Ahmad, but I'm really practicing. And that, when I do that,
You know, you can kind of, as long as you have your muscles can react to your brain, that's the hard part is keeping that root muscle strong. And that's the, that's the actual bridge between the humanity and the eternal and creative, you know, timeless to timed. So that's cool. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Dave was touching on that. Dave King, uh, Place with a Bad Plus, he was talking yeah. about that while yeah. he was um, on his call. And uh, one of the things that he touched on was a lot of the newer players that he hears have lost the quarter note. They have a they have a, a ride symbol. They're playing the notes, he said. But a lot of them, I find myself coming short because they don't have an internalization of the core mm-hmm. of let's say if we're playing swing of what mm-hmm. swing is built on. And it's it's the quarter note they have. To, and so I find my it's he said, you know, it's almost like there's a shallowness there that we've got to go a little bit deeper. There's a lot of notes going on, but the, there's yeah. like you said, there's not the root that's anchoring that whole thing. Like right. there, there is with, for instance, a Brian Blade, who I was just discussing with a with a student a couple of weeks ago. They're saying what he's playing is so fast, and I said, well, actually, the tempo seems quick, but he's he's not playing fast. I said you can hear the space in there, and he's approaching that space from a, a very melodic standpoint. Um, so that kind of touches on what he was talking about too. Man. A lot of what you and I've had is, um, we're going to say that seasoned people, older people, is we've had that one-on-one pull the coattail by an older musician who said, hey, bro, listen, <laughs> that's great, but can you do this? And, and he just called my bluff. And, and so for the next year, I just, you know, try to just keep the gig, which in New Orleans, which you played, you played New Orleans, right, Steven? Three years. Yeah, bro. go there but the gig says <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'll do this right sneak it in there so I'm still having fun still being me but still doing the thing the Steve Jordan hold on get my little necklace that's a bad dude bro hold on <laughs> oh yeah how's that Is good Steve Jordan, bro. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the uh, Beacon Theater live with James Taylor, man? No, it's a good. Uh, everything he does is it's like, okay, yep, that, that's what a drummer would do. That's perfect, you know? And he just played the gig. And now, uh, my, my, you know, I always knew he was a bad dude, but uh, golly, man, the John Mayer stuff's off the chain, but that is mature adult is called adult playing and all these kids if you sit one out of a hundred maybe get close to not playing a bunch of crap behind james taylor you know what i mean you know and that's it's funny i was i was talking to one of the professors at uh at berkeley and he was talking about this the the class that steve jordan taught okay and so he talked because they got all these guys at at berkeley and they can shed man these kids come in i don't want to say kids these players come in and and they're just they're heavy on on the chops and they can do that for days and so the first class steve would sit down and he'd say okay well we're going to cover you know billy jean today and you know all the guys would start rolling their eyes and so you know steve would would just lock in and he'd say we're going to Keep going, keep going, Steve. Let me and hear then that. he would, Go he would, say, do that again, bro. Let me hear that again. Come on, man. <laughs> Billy Jean. <laughs> he and Mama's so, the Green Lord. And, I know. <laughs> and he would say, he'd say, "All right, I need volunteers." And one of them would say, oh, "Okay, you know who can do it?" So they raise their hand, they get up there, and they go, you know. Fire. He said, go sit down, somebody else. And they would all get up there and he's, you know, within two or three measures, they had added something and he'd say, you're getting it wrong. Go sit down, you know? And, and that was kind of his point is like, if you can't be connected to that, that root part, that is that if you can't sit in that mm-hmm. for three, That's four, great, five great. minutes and be comfortable there, 
then we can't add anything on top of that because you can't do the you can't do the root right. Dude, I think your new slogan is sit in that. <laughs> sit in that. And then you cuz look, look, you all right, I don't share that a lot um because it's a personal moment and and it sounds so freaking cliche and and you know you're going to roll your eyes, but I literally was sitting in Africa in North Africa like literally, like bam, Wagadougou. And just having a day off and having brunch in this cafe outdoor and it was uh you know middle of july it was hot but it wasn't too hot and it was shaded and i was eating soup and they had a dude in the corner a amazing african musician and do you know those things that are like a gourd and they have three strings going up from them and you play them from this side yeah right. <clears throat> dude this because i've been i mean everybody with a half a brain loves elvin jones i mean bro what so i've always tried to figure out elvin from every angle except for what he's really coming from and i and i was sitting there and this dude's playing the beautiful stuff i remember just taking a coffee and stopping and going oh shit okay oh gotcha i'll do it with brushes why do a sticks man well, he was just doing those gorgeous, like, and sounded singing like a drone. But I heard, I was like, oh, shit. Okay, that's what, you know. Slow that down. Quarter note. Straighten it out. See, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, but I'm going one, two, three, one, two, three, bang, bang, bang. And just straightening out the three. And I was like, oh. That's a quarter note, bro. That's a freaking piece of clay, you know. Just like my <laughs> and, right now. you know, that's that's what is so hard to get people to understand. Players and and yeah, I mean, is that you, oftentimes what somebody's missing when you're trying to enunciate what is happening that is missing. Mm -hmm. What really needs to be said is the pulse isn't there. Like you're playing all the right notes; they're in the right places. But the the pulse is not there because you're not you're not sitting in it. You're not you're not committing to that pulse. It's like when you played that thing earlier. If you don't know who Baby Dodds is, oh, then man. you don't understand the importance of what you were playing there in that traditional New Orleans sense. And if you've yeah. never sat with a Baby Dodds recording and done that for hours, it comes off as a shallow thing. And that's that's where kind of the repetition uh, comes into play. Great. I couldn't agree more, man. Um, so we got like those. What are those videos? You sound great, man. You sound really good in seven, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bass, give bass player. Beer. Yeah, give me a good. Yeah, just give me <laughs> something underneath. Well, you can go crazy, but if I'm feeling a current or a wave, then I'm cool. Just give me something forward, maybe. Yeah. Um, so we got a couple of uh, questions here. Randy said, "So if I hear you correctly, the quarter note is the foundation, and everything thing else is color and musical." Mm -hmm, exactly. And then certain, this is going to sound weird, certain classical music or whatever um, doesn't really have a quarter note. It just has a movement like a flock of birds. There's no center to it, but there is. But it's not. It's very fluid. You know, it's like a lot of Gregorian chant that really, once you get deep into it, 
it's just like you just want to zone out <laughs> like you're having like a bell massage in the bed or something but you know what i find is and i'm okay with a lot of chops because i wish i had chops i wish i had those hands and then combine with what i what i do now you know it just probably would be kind of silly because i don't need it um it's kind of like when Maya Angelou speaks, she says so much with so little, so much, man. And just how to be a human being and treating each other as human beings produces, I mean, starting in the home, which is your quarter note, which is your foundation, it's your home, it's your family, it's your relationship. Everything you do to these drums is a relate. I'm relating my hand. That was a relationship. I'm controlling a relationship. You know, making the relationship beautiful is uh. there we go. So it's a relationship of of uh, you know the obvious, you know, gravity <laughs> number one. And you got a stick, okay, that's that's gravity number two. And you got yourself, you got your bones, sinew, blood, heart, whatever, spirit, mind. And you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and throw this in, but the longest, the furthest distance in the world is in, in, in every human being is from your brain to your heart to making those go like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm cool with that. I'm, oh, okay, you know, really, so you're not internally fighting your brain over your heart and not playing what you really know should. You ever done the gig and you did this because you thought it was going to be good? And you're like, what am I doing with my life right now? You know, well, why, 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 you know? Versus, you go, okay, I, that sounds great. But then you just kind of ease into the art thing right before they record and they record and you go. Versus. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, 1950s are over, sir. I, that, that was cool. <laughs> but, you know, so everything has to be relevant to your surroundings, your gravity, your spirit, but now your emotions are here. So you don't really want to gig with your emotions. Like you save that as fuel for positive fire, but you're living in your end light, but you really want to operate in your spirit. So when I'm sitting here and I'm going, that's my spirit speaking. That's not my mind going, what is it? Right, left, front, right, left, right, left. You know, like, no. So it is, and I have to do, I still have to go. Whatever the, the exercise is, just by doing that right then, right there, let's hope that I've improved my root muscle already today, at least you tiny bit. Just you know, one step closer every time. All you're doing when you play drums, all I'm doing, I would demonstrate this, is just playing big shapes. You know, so if you want to learn how to solo better, take a shape and make it flip it upside down and like mess with it like this, but you fill it in with a lot of notes, you know? any feel anything like so philly joe jones right it's just flam 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 classic philly joe but here's what you need to understand as a drummer okay there's a reason philly freaking felt awesome when he played because everything he plays is funky it's funky but you're going Ah! I got shit. So what? Okay, 
Okay. style you're playing, whatever it is, an amalgamation of a lot of stuff these days, you know, there is no bebop, Miles Davis, there's, it's, it's just a, a myriad of just hybridization, really, just all these kinds of music coming together. So to make that easy, I just think about the chord note. <laughs> that makes sense? So I've got, I've got, uh, sorry, I was reading some of these comments. Um, Bob's got a question, and maybe I can expand the question a little bit too, if you don't mind, Bob. So he said, does playing four on the floor help with quarter note recognition on the kit? And as a secondary part to that question, how can we help with quarter note recognition? What are, what are some tips that you can give for that? Like, I think you mean, Bob, quarter note recognition, like recognizing where your quarter note is the whole time? Sometimes, <laughs> yes. Like, I honestly, if I can get comfortable and I play for a while, it starts to feel like I'm um, I'm just not at a drum set and I'm somewhere else, but I'm doing the drum thing. So the rec when you're doing your bass drum on all four like that, you know, and so that's way too loud. Unless you're playing big band, yeah, that definitely quarter note recognition. But when you're playing small group, it's all there. So that's your quarter note recognition is your right hand playing top down. You know, rock is bottom up so it's always a marriage of the two in my brain because i'm really honestly country by heart but city by nature so i like both um which is why i dug columbia so much I'm like wow it's got everything you know, my <laughs> subway which we do not need <laughs> grant grant and i are, are secretly hoping that jeff decides to move here so, I'm, I'm trying now look god look lord make it happen I, like we're thinking like where you're living like little something what's it called Columbia, then right above that, what's that called? Spring Hill. Spring Hill, dude. Killer Vietnamese, sir. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, See, I'm good. That's good. It, did y'all stay at that hotel that I sent you? The Hampton Inn? Yeah. Yes, we did. Thank you. Yeah, you were like, you were like a mile from my house. Thank you so much. And, you know, she's a budgeter, so, like, it was very in our budget. So, thank you. Oh, bro. nice. <laughs> that's awesome so all right so i want to take if anybody has a question the reason we do these guest artists uh Please. sessions this way is because i try to think of if i was when i was 14 and i just picked up the sticks because i didn't start until i was 14 oh, wow. and i started okay. late yeah um and i had musical in my family though my mom was a minister of music and my dad was musical and so it was in my family but um so when, when i started at 14 what would have been the coolest thing in the world to me at that at that time and and the coolest thing in the world at that time would have been able to get on a video call with one of my you know with somebody that that, that i just respected and loved and could just pick their brain that way i would have i would have been that annoying kid i would have just kept them there all day yeah. um so we have one submitted question if you have a question raise your hands um happy to you know i would love for you to just get to talk to jeff and ask questions um Let's see here. Uh, all right. So, um, Grant, what submitted question we got? All right. We have uh, one submitted question. It's from Anthony. It says, hey, guys, Merry Christmas. Just wanted some guidance. I just joined a band and am in the process of getting all the songs down to prepare for gigs. So my regular practice schedule has taken a backseat. What would you focus on to keep progressing while prioritizing the gig? Wow. All right. Uh, Jeff, let me give you some some context for this we get this question a lot because people seem to separate learning music from practice time they seem to there's some divide there that with a lot of of drummers that they feel they need to have their their practice time and then they need to have their music learning time and that's it you've answered the question that's the problem right there there is no separation yeah and for me for me if I have something to work on, mm -hmm. like music in a group, 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to have more growth from that amount of music and working in it and hearing what the bass is doing, the guitar, the piano, and being able to put that with what I'm doing and trying new ideas. To me, I grow much quicker when my practice is directly related to, if we're going to talk about the root, which is and it's directly related to the root of music. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, you know, I guess that would be, you know, is, is, that, is that your answer to that? Don't separate the two? I would say, well, everything you just said is absolutely true. And we can go down some rabbit holes of what you brought up there as well, man. Um, go ahead, jump in them. Well, like, I mean, okay, there is no practice, Jeff, and performance, Jeff. It's all the same, Jeff. But it's taken a while to let what we're talking about, where you're like, my practice schedule and this. Um, I typically don't have to schedule myself to practice. I just wait. I'm inspired, and I come. I know I have to do something every day. Um, but I also have the luxury of doing this a long time and figuring out my lifestyle. And that takes a minute. They don't teach you that in school, how to be a drummer and a dude in life. Like, it's very weird. So everybody has a different path on that. But I would say if I was 14 and I wanted to get, learn some music, I think the key is getting away from the drum set into a chair, just listening and absorbing the actual melody form and the harmony of the song and then if it's lyrical then go back and study the the writer of the song study the history of the band everybody in the band know every musician is kind of where they're coming from because that'll tell you what the music is if you know the foundation of everybody's musical growth you know it, it, that's kind of your answer into saying oh this is not that bad it's just this I, i've heard this before and then i'll put it in my own way and do my own thing on it as long as you're playing a supportive role underneath the music like you're you're moving the music either slowly forward or whatever you're kind of a bulldozer just kind of holding it together do what you want but if you learn the melody man it, you know do 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 dee, dee. i don't have to think about one two and three i'm just shot i'm singing the melody on my ride symbol <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You know, it's there because I know the melody. Um, that's my answer is, is to learn the actual music, not the drum part that fits the music. That's bad because it, yeah. you're not. I mean, that's good if you want to keep that gig for sure. You have to do that. And it takes time and lots of gigs and failing to get your own thing on that. But if I was 14, I would go ahead and say, I'm 14, man, who cares? I'm just going to have the most fun I can learning this music and performing it, not really looking too far ahead of where it's going. Just making yeah. it the next. And I, I um, <clears throat> the number of times I have told people they need to be listening more is countless. Mm -hmm. We just don't do enough listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, when, when students ask me how I learn a song, I say, well, before I've ever got to the drum set, I've yeah. already listened to that song and if it's an unfamiliar tune, I've already listened to that song so many times that by the time I get to the drum set, there may be two or three things where I'm thinking, all right, in that part, I may have a little problem in this little area. I need to rough over that. Right. But I already know the song. We talked in a session right before Christmas. We were talking about melodically soloing, uh, using a melody to build to build a structure around uh, as a simplistic w way to, uh, to to approach soloing. And um, for me, that's the biggest part of my learning is the listening. And it was a big jump for me personally, whenever I stopped looking at my listening time as something different than my practice time. Just because I wasn't at the drum set didn't mean I wasn't, I wasn't learning, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And a friend of mine, Peter Martin, um, he was talking about, man, I'm always practicing in my head, even when I'm running or having coffee sometimes i'll be in like conversations right now thinking of what i need to work on based on what i just played not to ruminate in a bad way but to observe and be self-conscious so every time you hear me especially if you're paying money i need to bring something some fire i need to bring something new and fresh not exactly recreate the wheel <laughs> reinvent the wheel um yeah just i'm constantly that's why I love taking road trips, Stephen and Grant, because, you know, you get in your car and whoo, just kind of do thing and think. And then you start to the musical soil, the seeds that have been planted by all that listening, you know, Stephen, they start to grow 
And then you get to the gig and you're just like, wow, man, I'm hearing something different and I'm enjoying it. I'm not going to freak out and change it. I'm just going to let it roll. And the next thing I know, I look up and the cats are like, yeah, man, you know, because we're going down a new ski slope, new, new territory, man. We open a new chapter and versus this is what I have to do correctly. You know, there's no way, there's no correct way to do this interview we're doing right now. I, mean, I guess there is, but we kind of, we try to keep it as real as we can. And and you're taking your time to listen to me <laughs> kind of rant here. But if you don't bring something new, meaning if you don't wake up every day and grow yourself, like you are a garden. I mean, you, your body, you're an athlete. So take care of it. I do push-ups. I do whatever. I don't kill it because I'm 51, but I, I maintain. And um, and I learn something. I read. I play guitar. I teach piano. I teach guitar. I look like very little couple chords. And... I just do something that will challenge me and I put myself around challenging people that I know they won't always tell me what I want to hear, or I'll have conversations with certain people knowing they're going to disagree with me. So I can say, Hey, maybe I'm wrong on that. Or I just need to adjust my, my thinking, which is the key to this instrument. The more your thinking grows and changes and expands at any moment, you can go back to being the 14 year old drummer. I can in a second. You know, I, it's just, I just love it. And then you can go to be in the 51 year old or 37 year old businessman who plays drums at night or some stuff on the weekend. And just half the time, most of my enjoyment is really done right here by myself on the drums. You know, and I think that's key is, is if you weren't watching, I would be going nuts or I'd break it down and go down rabbit holes, put on some classical music and play ballads or mallets and, and flow with the music and not say, okay, this is the drum part or, you know, this is the orchestral part. I'll do something different, but it still matches the storyline of the musical. Mm -hmm. um, so all that being said is the more types of music you listen to, I mean, everything, I listen to everything. Um, listen to the stuff nobody checks out. Like Ben Howard or, you know. I love Ben Howard, man. Yeah. I got Virginia a playlist. Is. Yeah. Oh, man. He's, oh, man. What? Um, depth over distance. I mean, I'll sit there and go, what would I play on that? Because the dude that was playing guitar and drums is perfect. You know, you don't need anything. Um, but I listen to a lot of weird crap. My brother got me into some Rush and, you know, obviously the stuff. Like the dudes, Led Zeppelin, Cream, you know. I can even appreciate Neil Diamond. Okay. I mean, Karen Carpenter, dude, she was a bad mofo. Okay. Super bad. And her voice is, yeah, her intonation. Joni Mitchell, you know, Blades got me. Um, I talked to Brian, you know, quite a bit. He's, he's one of my oldest and best friends. And we just kind of keep each other, you know, uh, inspired during this time. And he's, re he gave me a book. And a friend of mine I saw in Shreveport gave me a book. So I think reading is part of that musical language because when Neil Peart writes a song, he's also hearing some stuff behind that and he knows it. It'll just gel with his lyrics. So I, I do think poetry, I don't think just boom, boom, second and pack hang all the time. You know, I, mean, I do, but I try to tell a story. You know, I try to just say, okay, this is interesting, Stephen. I think you'll like this. Okay. This is for, this is for, um, us getting over 50s okay but sometimes life can be scary so okay how do you make this drum set sound scary you know like here's a boat right some wind you know just Just kind of do it without thinking about it is the key. I had no idea what I was about to play. Uh, I kind of enjoyed that little group. I could probably write a song on that, but <laughs> you know, 
I mean, that's all Herlin Riley, Shannon Powell, Johnny <clears throat> Stokovich, Stanton Moore, all my New Orleans Ernie Ellie, like all these cats, you know, James Black. Uh, did I say Herlin Riley? Because that dude. Dude, know. every every name you just mentioned, I bring up Whoa! in conversations all the time. Uh, dude, you know, man. Shannon Powell taught me ah! how to play big band drums. Oh, yeah, that guy. That guy. Silly. It just, it's like, you'll go into like what used to be called Joe's Cozy Corner. It's now Treme. It's been got the coffee shop right now. But you just go in there and you'd be like, Dude, just be like, <laughs> you know? And he wouldn't even really do this thing, man. He would do this thing like, yeah. Hey, Clapper, where you at, man? You'd just be killing. Yeah. What's up, bro? Hey, man, hey, give me a cold drink, bro. I'd be like, okay. I'll get you a cold drink, sir, because you are a bad mofo. <laughs> the last time I saw him play, that's funny, because the last time I saw him play was at uh, at Vaughn's at midnight. We ate red beans and rice, and he was with Kermit Ruffins in the backyard barbecue swingers, and he was doing the same thing. He was at half the gig. He's like one hand over here hollering at people, and he's just burning it up with the other three limbs. <laughs> Hugging ladies, like, man, what? Okay, okay, cool. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> That's stuff you do with Harry Connick Jr., man. Golly. Oh, it's a, that's the stuff that taught me. I was, I was into Harry at that time, and his, his playing with Harry was, was killer. Yeah, you All right, so we, got, we got a couple of questions I do want to get to. Let's see. Um, and then we'll, we'll continue to, to ruminate. We, uh, Bob, I'll get you just a second. Let me get James, then Bob, then Monica. Um, James, what you got, man? You got your hand raised. Hey, how you guys doing today? Good. How are you? Good, good. Hey, Jeff, thanks for taking the time to do this today. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to throw out a question and get some advice uh, really from both of you. I picked up a new kit last week and um, I love it. It's a Ludwig classic maple. Sounds great. Um, the bass drum is not ported on the Rezzo head. The kit I came from had a large port on the Rezzo head and I got very comfortable with how that played. Mm. The the new bass drum that's not ported, I took it home and it's got a beautiful big tone to it. I love the tone, but the problem is I'm getting this foot pedal flutter and I've never had that before. And I'm wondering if it's the air inside the bass drum bouncing back off the rezzo head that's causing the pedal to flutter and it's driving me crazy. Steven, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, it, it <laughs> is. That's exactly what it is, James. So when you got a, when you got a port, um, so a lot of, a lot of older cats, um, they don't, they don't like a port. And if I have an option, I don't want a port in mine. Although a lot of sound engineers now want a port because they can put a mic inside there. I've actually had them come up to me on a gig and say, would you mind if I cut your bass drum head? And I'm like, I don't know. Would you mind if I took a hammer to your sound comp board? Would that be okay? <laughs> you know, no, you can't. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, um, but what happens is that port really allows them to get a mic inside of there. I think that was more of the development there than actually how it sounds. Um, so what happens is that that air doesn't doesn't it's not released outside of there, and so it does it kicks back and there's the the kick for a better uh, definition is more buoyant. There's, it's more balloony because there, the air is not getting out of there. So whenever you go to bury that beater in there, it's going to bounce back or flutter a little bit more than it usually would because you have that air hitting back and forth between those heads yeah. in there. And there's no release yeah. for it. Very hard to get clean 16th notes when it's doing that. Yeah. yeah. And now, the other question is, is it bad if you cut a hole in it? No. If you want to port your front bass drum head because you're used to playing like that and it's and it's comfortable to you, that's okay. I got a ported bass drum head right here. Why? We got to put a mic inside of it and it's easier, you know. So there's nothing. Don't feel bad if you want to put a ported head on there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. But the the other. I wish solution, I didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah, I wish wish I did because I love the sound. But I do bury the beater. I, maybe I should work more on the technique of, of not doing that. But uh, to maintain the kind of playing I'm used to, uh, I'd like to continue to play that way. And if that means putting a port in it, then so be it. Yeah. So, you know, and back to that, what we were talking about earlier with Jeff, 
and that is you know adjusting to whatever kit you may be on and if that's going to be your main kit and you want to be able to bury that beater how you usually do then you would port the head and that would kind of solve that issue um but if you didn't if you're like well i love the tone so much that i want to adjust i want to adjust my playing to accommodate the the tone of the drum then that's another thing too and then you just to, you learn to play off the head you learn to bring that that beater off the head so yeah yeah okay i'm in okay. here okay. yeah jeff you got it i was thinking with what you're saying but maybe just um take a very small hole like um i bought these symbols and they had holes in them but uh and what it does it makes it quicker because the air releases and i actually dig it so just maybe have a little small hole somewhere near kind of near the edge of the head or somewhere or two little small holes and make it pretty somehow make it artsy and then that would give you your feel back i would imagine mm -hmm. okay cool i will do that and, then, and I, put, I put in the chat jeff that when you started playing i, I noticed my left foot tapping to the quarter notes involuntarily so uh, nice feel. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, man, that's all, you know, it's John Bond. Feel. <laughs> it, I love it. There you go. Thanks, man. Thank, um, you, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, so we got, um, we got Bob and then David. I got you after Bob. Uh, no, uh, we got Bob, Monica, and then David. Okay. Bob, uh, does Jeff use a metronome in creative ways to get, the, to get that strong internal pulse? That would be a massive yes because my brain is, um, you know what they say, to keep time takes a, a large amount of your intellect um, process. And it takes a large amount of con concentration. So to get my concentration, I would put on something in the background. Metronome, yes, more so with piano and guitar. Uh, I would have to put on something that feels good, that doesn't speed up or slow down, which is normally James Brown or like uh, Billie Jean or, or like, uh, some of the old like Alabama or uh, Creed, you know, just got that great little groove. So I'll just uh, work on subdividing the groove is what I do. So to me, groove, time, feel, it's all a swirl. It's like making a pie. There is not just time. There's not just feel. There's not just, you know, the crust and the baking of it. It's all a process of cooking as you're going, and which is why we love what we love because the dudes are in the kitchen just crushing it you know put some garlic here whatever some chicken whatever you know not to get too country but like really the less i think about drums and time and the more i think about feel and real life crap like a big fat woman walking down the street you know what i'm saying oh my toes are hurt today you know i i i that makes me have fun versus like one yeah, because I, I can't get with that. It's hard to just sit there. I get bored. And so to keep this interesting eternally, that's how I practice my quarter note. That's, yes and no. I, that reminded me of a story. I may have told you this story, but it's uh, Raymond Weber. Oh, man. Explaining to me how, how to, he was explaining to uh, a couple cats how to, um, you know, we were, we were playing a lot of uh, the classic covers back then, but to me in New Orleans, they dug in kind of those extra oh. layers deep to get it authentic. And we were playing, you know, we were playing Real Lady Marmalade and all those, uh, all those wow. classics, but we were the original. Uh, talking about Brick House, which people see as a very simplistic uh, song, but to get that feel and the slight bounce that they have in the bass drum, all that stuff is hard. And so he was saying, you know, I can't play that song unless I'm thinking about a big fine black woman walking down the street you know and he's sitting there explaining like this is the visual you should have because they're talking about this woman that's a brick house she's she big she's a proud of it she's fine like he said that's what you got to get into when you you know what is that song about you know what what are we trying to 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 say with that song um so that reminded me of that i also got a story about my drum teacher Jeff Mills got the gig opposite me and he oh okay uh, he took over from Raymond Raymond was going down the street and um so they had uh my drum teacher on e drums and then Raymond was on the acoustic kit and they would switch back and forth from the two of them and I went and saw him whenever he was kind of trying to get into the band before I moved down there 
And when he was playing, they would turn, you know, Jeff on and he was he was trying to learn the gig and everything. And every time he'd go for a drum fill, you would hear Raymond yell over the divider, stop playing all that shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he'd go back to the pocket every See, drum fill, classic. Raymond. That, that's a college education right there, man. Yeah. In the moment. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. Um, all right. So Monica says, uh, focusing on the melody, uh, I have recently seen quite a number of drummers on TV who are not singing officially with the band, but you can see them singing along with the music to themselves. Um, I do this a lot. I do this a lot. Um, I don't know. Jeff, do you find yourself singing while you're playing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you singing the melody or are you hearing like just harmony or bass lines? It depends. What are you thinking? Sometimes I sing the melody. Sometimes I sing a more tonal version of what I'm playing. Um, and sometimes I have to tell myself to stop singing because I'm singing so loud I can't hear the music. <laughs> well, if you were to put a microphone here, you'd probably hear, <laughs> you know, like I, I just really, wherever the tone of the bass is, I try to go for the ones, one, three, six, two, five, one, really try to, you know, hear it. But what I'm that's, actually singing is probably really bad. So. <laughs> that's what I love about Elvin, man. You can hear him grunting and singing and groaning on top of his playing. Oh, yeah. Um, David, what you got, man? Yeah, oh, hi there. How you doing? All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. Great. Uh, great. Well, this is the first session I've come to, and I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's great to, to oh. see this and to hear this. It's fantastic. Um, so my, my, my question is around the quarter note and when you're doing something, say, with odd times. Obviously, the quarter note's running through odd times. But kind of turning to Monica's question before now, you know, you're going to be singing. I find when I do odd times, I'm singing the bass line or I'm singing the feel like in take five rather than counting the quarter note through. You're definitely feeling that strong quarter note, and sometimes even the eighth note. But, I mean, do you approach odd time differently or do you, do you just feel it and find that feeling there and then swing with it? I mean, how, how does that feel for you? I think uh, it's a great question, and that's such a personal way to – approach odd time to me man i wish i could just show you around my room I, I see things in numbers uh so i think that's a gift that i see visually crap like most paintings are in four because it's square um i see a lot of hedges outside brushes that are seven so i divide the seven into two things you know whatever it is four and three three and four five and two now if it's a big old seven with a little bitty seven tip then i hear i hear one you got so I'll actually go, uh, 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 uh. But I'm feeling this, bam, 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 bam. So I can do anything over the bam as long as I don't mentally lose the bam, lose the, uh, that's in that up seven, but now down five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. I feel, uh, 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 and I'll think, uh, <laughs> that's what literally I'm thinking. And then the harmony will come in and you'll just, you'll be your inner, uh, uh, uh. It's just there. So I'm feeling the quarter note, I'm thinking the shape. But when I do, uh, uh, I'm thinking of done. Uh, um, oh, there's always two things going, um, Michael, right? David. David, sorry, David. David, uh, there's two things going. So you got the chicky chicky, but I don't think of the chicky chicky. I just let it happen. That's the four year old dude in the car doing that. You got to let that dude out. That's you're, you're letting out the wiggles. That's what we call the dog. Let him run the yard, but you got a leash on him. So that that leash is also that I think that sting tune goes like that. And so I'll sit there and check out uh, either Omar Hakim or what's the French cat? Manu Cache. God. Yeah, Manu Cache. Woo! So I'll practice that shape. One. I think it's in seven. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, literally. 
until this becomes comfortable. So, uh, man, David, I would sit here for five minutes with probably a metronome to just go. And I would get comfortable with, so I'd go. comfortable because I work through the little um, whatever I don't call them feels I call them feel a certain feel this is a certain feel I'm not at all thinking one two three four one or I'll be done you know um, it's uh it's it, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of a lot, man. I'm like parades and Mardi Gras, but not the cliche Mardi Gras, like real people. You know, I've, I'm seeing it because I've been there and I've experienced that. So it's the only way I can really play it real and keep it real because I've done it and I've lived it. And I've sat there for three hours and gone. Sir, hours and then, but but it's easy because people are going, get a clap, woo, get you some, you know, like people are firing you up. It's not like it's not like a museum piece. Your 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 community is folk music, bro. Yeah, that's what a lot of people in New Orleans. um, Well, a lot of people that aren't from New Orleans, they don't quite understand the vibe there. And Jeff, I've told the story a lot. They get tired of hearing it. Me trying to learn second line. And I'm from, no, I'm, I sucked at it. <laughs> oh, dude. I, and so, you know, I was playing the whitest, you know, oh, oh. you know, and, yeah. and so I got, I, the club owner on Bourbon Street, John Wayne, or whenever he was there at the famous door, he would open the doors early for me to come in. And while the bar backs were cleaning and everything before they opened, he would let me practice because I was oh, in an wow. apartment. So I got to, I'm like, oh man, this is, this is great. I'm getting to practice second line on Bourbon Street, you know, and I sucked at it. I, it was so bad. And John was a drummer and he would come down and he'd say, no, no, no. And he'd kick me off the drum set and he'd start just playing this. And I'm like, man, I'm playing the same notes. And it took me, you know, I told people it took me having red beans and rice at midnight at Vons. It took me understanding what it smelled like at three in the morning. It took me going to Cafe du Monde, seeing a funeral, seeing a wedding. It took me understanding the culture. And then one day I all of a sudden sat down and it felt good. I had not practiced at all. There was nothing I had done except eat gumbo and hang out at parades. And all of a sudden I sat down and it was, there was grease on top of it and it felt right. But I, right. it was it was here you that was holding it. me back. You lived it, and it got into your system. You know, it's a cultural thing, man. It's if you absorb the culture, and now it's coming back out of you, right? Yeah. yeah. So relating that back to odd time signatures, I think they're only odd because, well, one, they're they're in five or seven. It's an odd number, but yeah. I think they're only yeah. odd because we don't spend much time with them. Other cultures that spend time in these odd time signatures let's say indian drumming where it's it's all over the map um it's not odd to them it's very normal to them um so what is your what is your advice as far as spending time with the odd time signatures i mean okay i just listen to a lot of different world music like real world music dig down because now you got youtube and go to freaking you know johannesburg and just find you some stuff that's weird or odd or or Indian music, raga, or, you know, obviously, what's the famous um, <clears throat> Ravi Shankar mm-hmm. you know, place to start? And then I would say for jazz drummers, don't check out jazz for odd times. Check out something different. Um, like, dude, Brush is all over the map. I mean, they're crazy you know losing it's in 11 it's in five it's in six um and uh, it just learn the way they transition it because this is really really unnatural that's really 
really hard for me to play. It really is because it's not human. This is human. That's human, you know. So just don't be afraid to not play four four. And then when you do. My biggest advice to flow on the drum set, this is a really technical question, is when you're listening to something odd, roll the odd meter. Rolling in the odd meter, so five. So it makes you think differently and then when you roll something happens man you get to be more like dancing because you can't go and feel good i mean you can but you can feel good i won't but when i watch herlin do this his left hand that melody that rhythm but it's not it's not just a rhythm because that's where it went wrong is when people started writing books on drum sets can't do it bro it cannot do it it's not going to work you have to show them verbally in human terms you can't read some crap on a paper and be like oh yeah you know it's not gonna happen but if you watch dudes charlie hunter loves this is my charlie stuff second line, right, Stephen? Now, if I went like this, he'd be like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What? What? But if I go... I 
that's some straight up hurling right there. I got everything from that. And then I'll take it and try to do my thing, but he's such an impression on me that I feel like his thing is so human. And so if you're playing rock and roll, you still have to dance. You still have to feel. And we're never really thinking at 4-4. Are you guys? Because I'm not. I'm thinking over the bar, before the bar. I want to do all before the bar. I rarely go one. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and that's you, know, you talking about playing rock and, and dancing. You know, to me, that's what people feel whenever they hear um, whenever they hear a, you know, a John Bonham, a Steve Gadd, whenever they hear all these heavy, um, Steve Jordan, these guys are, they bring such an original feel to it because they're unapologetically just themselves on the drums behind. You get that a lot in jazz, um, and, and not as much in the rock genre because there's this timidity to put yourself out there as this is this is how I dance around whatever this is. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was gonna I was gonna say, Jeff, uh, you might dig this app if you don't have it. It's for discovering music. It's called it's called Radio, but it's R A D I O O O O O Radio, and you can the app is real simple you just tap on anywhere in the world and you tap on what year you want it to pull up and it'll pull up it'll pull up random music from that year you could say i want to hear you know uh independent artists from you know south africa in 1972 and it'll it'll pull up something and you're just like what is this crazy music that i've never heard you know um it, that it's a really fun app to play around with great man radio radio uh that was a good question david thank you did great. that did that answer the question uh we can't hear you buddy oh there we go um it, it more than answered the question it was it's because i think a lot of the times uh, my approach in the past though i've never been a great counter mm -hmm. it's um has been to listen because uh, it, otherwise, it becomes a bit too much like sport, and the music starts to sound like you're kind of competing with, with something that you're not really sure who's who you're competing with. Whereas, whereas what you've just done there, Jeff, that's when you were talking about Elvin Jones earlier, you were talking about the guy in the bar, and there's that kind of polyrhythmical feeling that's going on. That's exciting stuff. That's real. That's real earth and life, and 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 that's always where I've always aspired to try and do that, but failed dismally on most of the most attempts. But you know, that's, that's what it's about. But thanks very much. It was really interesting. Thank you. You bet. Um, okay, so we got a question about your drum kit, Jeff, from okay. Bob. Bob's wanting to know about your gear. What are you playing? Okay, man. Um, I, right now, I'm, I'm really digging this. It's called Angel Drums. They're Hungarian. Um, I think it's from a little city outside of Budapest, but I'm not sure. But Angel Drums... And um, this is a wing wood, it's an extremely hard wood, a wing wood. Uh, I think it's up near zebra wood, uh, that kind of. So they're super heavy. I mean, I don't think I have a, yeah, I don't have a clear head, but they're really thick. And they have a, a ring on the end, um, inside of the hoop, another wing wood, like reinforcement ring. This is wood, and they make all their hardware. So just it kind of has a symbiotic thing with the hardware the way it feels to, to just man i just like you can really beat the crap out of that tom and not worry about you know obviously i don't have it on the bass drum so there's i don't i like that when i gig but for my own personal thing i like this better and i loosen the bottom thing around here a little bit uh and this is a great snare made by seven six drum company out of new orleans man you may know this guy mark pagani he's a world renowned photographer turned drum maker and i would meet him with stanton moore would come out to the gigs and hey yo you gotta hang with my dude mark and we'd hang out with the dude brian that owned um what used to be the istanbul cafe i think it's something else now on frenchman what's that main club on frenchman steven not maison or snug harbor but no i know um blue moon is it blue is it blue moon I, I, oh god i don't i just remember a blue moon sign anyway there right across from cafe brazil and and mark would always talk about drums and he wanted he was a great drummer on the side so he made this drum uh out of zebra wood and and he put the you know just break drum i like that and i have an a and f was called a 
a bell aluminum bell is like twice the width as a normal a and f out of austin so if you've noticed my snare drums have to sound like a timbali or at least something not snare drummy and so then when i go to do the snare it has like an earthy thing to it you know obviously that's way down but i can go up to kenny washington tightness if you need to um and then this is a jesse simpson redo 22 and use some old K15s uh, that were repairs, got a little hole on top. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm really digging Spiz, old Ks, and some more boutique symbols these days. Um, but I, I do Zildjian, man. They always have great prototypes. So I have a 20 prototype normally right here. Yeah. Um, I really like that one you had, Mark. I mean, um, Steven, really like that one. Yeah, that, that's what I was about to say. That some of my favorite symbols I've got of theirs are prototypes. Amazing. Um, I got the the twenty two. Is that a twenty two inch over here? Twenty two inch prototype or twenty one inch uh, cluster crash, and then a fourteen inch cluster hi hats, <clears throat> which they say one of the bottoms of them says like a sweet bottom. So I don't know if they took a sweet bottom hi hat, and then I don't know how they configured that, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you guys got any questions, go ahead and throw them in. We got a few more minutes and then we'll wrap up. Um, you can either raise your hand or you can throw them in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and uh, referring to your A and F snare, mm -hmm. I have yet to hear a snare drum from those guys that I don't like. Uh, me too, man. Uh, I, I, every one of them I hit, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I wonder if I, <laughs> I wonder if I just play that. I wonder if they'd notice if I took it. This one gets swampy real fast, man. It, it, uh, Does it? Something about a metal snare is it's like just hanging out with a dude that you get along with. It's always going to work. And you got, you know, just like you're going to be cool in any situation. You can take it up or down. And, you know, and I noticed Bill Stewart plays them and Kenny does. And uh, Blade has, plays a lot of metal snares, I think. Um, but I also want to say, man, I am very fortunate to um, have an artist endorsement with Vic Firth. And I've had one very much thanks to Stanton Moore. Uh, introduced me years ago so you know even if you're not a professional drummer you can still get endorsements or you know um if you're a faithful um, believer in their product a lot of people will offer you discounts too and i think that's important for cats to understand that aren't professionals and they're younger it it doesn't matter i love vic firth it doesn't matter though the name of the stick or the it, it matters about the quality of the stick or the instrument you're playing so when you ask about what I'm playing, this is an old Ludwig because it has a tone no new cowbell can get. It just it's not going to do it. The metal's different. Acid rain. I mean, there's so many variables in metals and woods. Um, and also, I play an SD2 because I it did for the New Orleans thing, and I do like a, um, I think it's like a big man on my right. Anyway, but uh, what I'm saying to the younger cats, that's all great and good to have endorsements, and, and it's, but it's not an endorsement. It's a relationship that you have with people behind the scenes about the product that they believe in. And that's, that's what's key to remember, man. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't matter what you play, how you play it. I mean, what you're playing it with, but it's how you play it, how you say it on any instrument, man, any drum set. I've seen Tane sit in on just crazy... I won't name the company, but they were not very good drums in the early 90s. And he made this kit sound beautiful by how he was doing it. He was, it was you know, it's, it's important to learn as a drummer that it's, it's here. It's not here. A lot of cats go backwards, like I'm saying. It's really you on your seat making it feel great because you feel great. And then you have great instruments and sounds and tones to express that inner, you know, creative mind. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I've, I've talked a lot with them about <clears throat> good versus bad and how much we label things immediately as soon as we hear it as a good or a bad thing. And whenever we do that, it's automatically labels that in our mind that we don't want to play it. And instead, I tell them, you know, just look at it for quality. Can we find any quality in there? And if there's any quality in there, maybe it's not the quality that we need right now. But there is a quality there, and so I'm yeah. going to keep that around for whenever I need that. You know, I tell the same thing to 
people whenever I'm talking about, I got kids, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in that phase of life. We got a 14 year old, 11 year old, a four year old. We're just like oh, in the thick wow. of it. And um, <clears throat> my four year old wanted to hang out at two in the morning last night. She just thought it was real cool for like two and a half hours to hang out with dad. Um, it was it was great. We had a good time. But finally, I was like, if you, you got to go to sleep, <laughs> you got to go to sleep. Um, but uh, I, that's why I tell them. I'm like, there's not good and bad kids, guys. There's just they got a they got uh, they got a quality that I do not care for right now, and hopefully that will work out of them later in life. But it's not an overall bad kid, you know. Uh, same with you. same way with sounds, you know. Yeah, I mean, and drums change too. Cymbals change. You know, sticks change. Everything changes, man. And, and as being flexible with your equipment. Now, yes, I'm a. I love messing with different cymbals, and there's. We all have our simple buddies, you know what I'm saying, that we trade with and, and exchange. But I would say you just made you made me realize something, Stephen. Basically, whether we like it or not, there's two things that you are as a drummer. Period. There's no escaping it. Well, number one, you're a leader, whether you like it or not. <clears throat> For me personally, it took me a while to be comfortable with that leadership. And now I see the servanthood in the leadership. I'm serving the music in them. Therefore, it's, it's a true leadership. You're, you're a great coach. Number two is, uh, man, just have fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, life is so hard. You know, Stephen, you have kids, man. This is supposed to be an outlet, you know, not where you go down a ruminating rabbit hole about how bad you suck or can't do this or that, or you don't sound like the comparative thing just kills the spirit. So the most important thing you are other than, um, you know, a leader is you're a philosopher. You know, we're philosophers. Every one of us that's any has attunement to music is a philosopher. And the way you improve this is just basic crap on this pad. But the real thing is improve your mind, improve your humanity, improve your personhood, improve your intentions. So if your intent's good when you sit down, your content, excuse my shirt, man, sorry, your content's going to be good because intention always precludes content and drummers overlook the fact of maybe if i just grow as a person and my drumming will get better and i don't have to worry about this 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 and this crap that I, these challenges unnecessarily challenge pressure you put on yourself so don't put any more pressure on yourself put the pressure on the drums man you know get it out work it out and and be be yourself you know because everybody else is taken so be happy with who you've been given. And and I mean, I didn't say, hey, let me have no hair at 51. I'd much rather have some hair, okay? A little less belly, but I just, I'm cool with it. And you find the ultimate thing you do if you want to re remain a healthy drummer mentally is surround yourself with people that celebrate you. You know, because there's, there's a lot of haters out there. There's a lot of quote unquote professional drummers that, you know, it's, at the end of the day, man, can you sit down and have a cup of coffee with this woman or man and just enjoy the passage of time with the conversation? That's what the drums are. They're just a folk instrument. They're about people, you know, about relationships. And your relationship to this is going to change all the time. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And I'm glad I don't sound like Stephen. I sounded when I tried to play my first second line. Terrible. Horrible. Yeah. That's a, it, you, you talking reminds me of, um, it's a quote, and I, I forget if it was uh, Einstein, maybe it's attributed to him, but then again, every quote I feel like is attributed to Einstein. Um, it's if you, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll always be a failure. Yeah. Whenever we're talking about comparing ourselves to other people, you know, it's just a completely, you can't really compare apples and oranges. They're two different fruits, you know. <clears throat> um, David, I saw you, David Price, I saw you had your hand up. Let me know if you, raise it again if you've got something you want to ask. Randy, I see you got your hand up. Hi. Um, first of all, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, this, has been, this has been really incredible and enlightening for me. Uh, I'm an old guy. I'm 65. Uh, I started playing when I was 12 and wow. got, in, got into, uh, uh, I was in an area where the old country, Western, was, was uh, what I played, and that's how I made money. Twenty five dollars a night uh, for for a, a twelve year old kid playing in nightclubs on the weekends was was a huge amount, and um, so I got to play with a lot of other other uh, kind of B 
uh, big country Western stars, Tony Booth, uh, Susan Ray, Homer Joy. This is going way back. Uh, I even got to play one time with Hank Thompson, which was a big thrill for me back then. Um, and they attributed um, uh, the drums as to just keeping time. So what they required, and this is kind of going back to what you said about the quarter, pul quarter no, pulse. And I have been really searching for it for, for pretty much my lifetime, trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. But, but all they required of you was a hi-hat, snare, and kick. That's it. If you had a cymbal there, they took the cymbal away and put it off, side, off to the side of the stage. Wow. Wow. I remember I remember Tony Booth doing that to me one time, just taking it and walking off the stage and putting it on the side. So I guess um, uh, my point is, um, the, and I'm sure I've heard it many times before, but you put it in such a way that I could, I it finally the light bulb went off after all these years. Um, was the drums are an inanimate object and you pull out of the drums your personality for whatever reason i've been i've heard that i've been told that my high school teacher said play musically play musically <laughs> okay what the hell does that mean they're drums i hit them yeah, no. uh, but for the first time the light bulb went off so i wanted to say thank you your insight was spot on and my drumming will change from here on out. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That really warms my heart to hear. And that's what it's all about is, is you make me a, just hearing that now. I mean, man, that really warms my heart and makes it all worth it, you know? Um, but I will tell you, I'm only here as a quote unquote successful drummer because I failed so many times on my face. I've fallen on my face and just lost work, you know, but I just never gave up that's and the so kudos to you and, and bravo for not giving up and just doing because you know like um a lot of people say you do what you love and, and you get through the tough times of the love the affair with that but man you know thank you so much that means a lot that was worth coming on here today just you know and this so our whole conversation kind of reminds me of something i'm going through right now there's a <clears throat> a book that i'm reading called the practice by one of my favorite authors named seth godin and he's actually in marketing in the business world, but he's a brilliant thinker in the creative aspect too. He has a podcast called Akimbo as well. And the, his, his whole point is whenever we commit to something, let's say we commit to learning the drums. He said, if you commit to the end result, which who knows what that could be, if you commit to the end result, you'll always come up short because there's no end result. Life is not an end result. The only end result is that we're gonna die. And that's overall, you know, it's done. He said, but if Wait, you commit, if die. you commit to the practice of it, he said, if you commit to not the end result, but actually not catching the fish, but you commit to the act and the practice of, let's say fly fishing, the mm -hmm. fish is irrelevant. Whether you catch a fish is irrelevant because you're committed to the practice itself. So a good or bad day is based upon did you show up did you hone your craft did you put yourself on the hook by publishing towards people that's how he kind of separates professionals wow. from others is that they put themselves on the hook they're not just doing everything they want to do they put themselves on a hook with an audience and he says are you pushing yourself forward but are you committed to that practice of i'm a drummer i'm a musician it doesn't matter if i have a good day or bad day i am this thing so therefore i am going to practice it every day um, and it really puts a different slant on everything you commit yourself to. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, well, I'll just settle into this process and this practice every day. Yeah. Uh, kind of like Randy, what you're talking about. I've been, I've been chasing this thing my whole life. It's, it's just that the practice. It's like being dedicated to the practice of it. In what you're saying, loving the actual practice itself. It, it, I mean, practicality, think about it. It works if you're practical, if you practice, it works. Um, Steve and I remember walking into uh, Steve and I had coffee and, and we met and in the square there in Columbia and he took me over to his beautiful studio but I immediately I felt a commitment of your studio you know and I met Grant and his commitment and his vibe like just the energy in that room um it's it's a wooden building you know but spirits live there even when you leave like I'm, I'm a huge spirit person I, I absolutely believe we're body mind and spirit Absolutely. So 
I felt y'all spirit of commitment, not a spirit of like, I hope this works and let's just make a lot of money. I did not feel that. You walk into CBS studios, you feel like, okay, they want money. They need money because it's a multi-million operation. Whereas I was like, this is freaking awesome. And he's taken a long time to build this. And I'm not just, you know, shine your shoes here. I'm saying, man, that takes that kind of heart, that kind of intent to say, and Herlin used to say, man, well, I'm just a drummer. That's what I do. And I, 10 years later, I'm like, that's what he meant. He gets in the cab. He goes to the airport. He just does the thing. He makes his life work in order to get on these things with a band and create music because that's a gift. We heal. This is such a healing instrument because the second you hit it, man, there's a vibration. There's a, it goes back through you. And it reminds you you're human. And, and that humanness coupled now with a gig where you have to do that, bro. And I used to do only bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat, you know, that's another, that's another thing, man. But what, what a great drummer said to me, he's like, well, that's just where they count it off. I'm going to stay there versus fighting it versus like, ah, that's it. Swing, ah, feeling good, ah, too loud, you know, like versus just, okay, I'm, that's what I'm gonna do. And how Shannon, you talking to cats, man, you know, just be like, yeah, so I can sit here and do this and have a conversation, not as deeply, but it's like you are creating an actor, a muscle of a new, of like who you really are. You're really bringing yourself out. Like actors kind of do that and they go into character. You literally, I literally sit down and sort of go into who I am as my character in this world is, this is who I am, you know? And so, and I'm enjoying finding a lot of shortcomings these days, man, especially in my left hand, my right foot, slow as a turtle. So that's been really cool to suck at some stuff really bad. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave you with that. Keep sucking. <laughs> 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 I love it, man. Um, this has been a great session. There's a ton of people in the chat talking about how inspired they are. Um, yeah. thank, so thank I love that. I love I, that. Thank you. And thank, thank God for this, man. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, man. We sure do appreciate it. Um, for, for everybody that uh, is tuned in, Grant, who do we, uh, when's our next live session? Is it tomorrow? Yeah, we have a practical applications call tomorrow at 3. Yeah, so anybody that hasn't been to those, that's where we take very small things, mm -hmm. uh, like a quarter note, which seems very small, and then we try to expand upon them, and I show you what all we can do with something like dynamics or something like a very simple sticking. Uh, so we try to apply it practically to our playing. So, uh, Jeff, thanks so much, man. We're definitely going to have you back. And, I want to um, get a membership. I want to I be a student. <laughs> no, no, because I'm going to be taken from you. Which reminds me, man, you taught one of my buddies, uh, Darian Douglas. Darian DD, I love that guy. It was up at his place off of Britannia. He had a little half double. Yeah, yeah. man, we uh, we we went to to college together. Darian oh, really? I did. Yeah, so I I went with him and um, uh, Nate, his uh, bass playing buddy, and um, okay. Scott Johnson, sax player. Yeah, Scott's bad. So man, yeah, man. Yeah, Darren I hadn't seen Darren. I miss him, man. He's a funny cat. I love that guy. Man. <laughs> you guys man. have similar spirits. I could totally see that. Totally see that. Yeah. You know, uh, what? I just want to add one thing, man. You know, don't be scared to be your own teacher and trust your mind. There's a reason it's your mind. You know, and there's a reason it's telling you you're good. <laughs> so listen to that. I'm cool. Because. <laughs> Who are you trying to prove anything to, man? I, that, don't do this for affirmation, or that's all you'll ever get from it. So, I love it, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, if you'll hang here real quick, we're going to go ahead and cut the call out, and uh, we'll see everybody on the next call. And uh, this will be posted later in the members area with jump links to all the questions and all of that stuff. So we will see all y'all on the next call.